Uh, let's come back with the quantum well. So in the previous class, uh, we solved the Schrodinger equation, the eigenstate for the quantum well. Okay, the uh, eigenstate is here. And then the eigenenergy is this one, and then there's a fundamental frequency you can define as the frequency of the uh, ground state. And then um, we, in the last class, we also calculated the expected position for all this ground state. And then clearly you can see because there are even other, either it, uh, odd symmetry or even symmetry, so that when you square it, right, square root of it represent the probability. Uh, when you do that, then they are actually all uh, even symmetry, so that you get your uh, position, expected value of the position always in the middle. C zero L. And then we also calculate the um, deviation, okay, standard deviation or variance or uncertainty, okay, they're all the same thing here, of the position measurement. It's like you're measuring for many, many times, and what is the expected deviation from the average value. And what you can see is, okay, it's actually, uh, you can calculate that by using um, the definition. You can calculate that, and then actually inside you will see you need to use the uh, integr uh, integral by part, okay? And then uh, you get this, and then what it tells you is that for all this ground state, okay, you will get some uncertainty in your measurement. And uh, after measuring position, uh, the next thing, of course, we say, okay, you have position, you have momentum, right? So the next thing is, of course, to discuss uh, what will happen if we try to measure momentum. And again, we first start using the um, you know, eigenstate. And then, first thing I want to ask is that the eigenstate here is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Is this also the eigenstate of the momentum operator? Let's say the momentum is this. You think it's yes? Yes. Any different opinion? Is it a Hamiltonian if it's the momentum divided by 2m? Um, Mm -hmm. Let me let me um, let me ask this. Okay, for the for this state, right? Because we know it's the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian of the energy. Then you know that when you measure it, it has a definite energy, right? It has one energy value. If you measure the nth state, you get this energy. Okay, does this energy correspond to one momentum? No, right? Actually, at least two, right? There's one to the right, one to the left, because the energy in, uh, energy in the infinite potential well is P squared divided by 2m, right? So for each, e, P, each energy, you will get plus minus 2m. One moment, I need to turn off the, uh, the humidifier. So for each energy, you actually get two momentum, right? So at least what it means is that, okay, this cannot be, this state cannot be the momentum eigenstate. Because when you say something is the eigenstate of an operator, that means when you measure that, you get a value, right? A single value. Every time you measure that, you get the same value. But then here, okay, for the energy, the momentum has two value, okay? And this is actually true for most of the uh, most of the system. Your um, energy eigenstate is not your momentum eigenstate. The only exception is the um, the only exception is a free electron. Okay, just free electron. There's no potential, nothing. 
And that's actually not a very interesting case, so kind of um, not very um, important. Okay, can anyone can everyone understand this? Okay. And then, okay, then, you know, we kind of have the tendency, right, to, to um, let's say if we, I ask you to measure the momentum, then by you, 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 you know, your first intuition is, well, there are two possible ways to do it. One is to do a Fourier transform, right? Because we know that you can um, get the momentum probability distribution by doing a Fourier transform of the position probability, right? Okay, so this is one way. This is uh, a textbook way. Okay, and then um, we can also be a little smart. Some of you might try to do that. Is that, okay, we know the momentum operator, the eigenstate of the momentum operator is actually quite straightforward because your momentum operator is h bar i partial partial x, right? So a momentum eigenfunction would be would be simply a, a first order differential equation okay equals p psi p right and then it's a first order differential so you can easily solve that psi p is actually e to the i k x and then k equals to p divided by h bar. Okay, so it's a plane wave, right? You plug this back in, in here, first derivative i cancel each other and then you get h bar k, okay, in the front, h bar k, and h bar k is your momentum, okay? And then, okay, then you can see, then we know that if we kind of assume, okay, this is correct, then uh, we can use the postulate saying that if you have a wave function and then you expand it, okay, you expand it in terms of the eigenfunction of your operator, A, right, that's in general, here it will be substituted by P, then this alpha n will be the probability of measuring the eigenvalue a n, right? So then you can see, okay, then we can kind of do this because this eigen uh, eigen function of the momentum operator is relatively e uh, simple. Okay, then you can actually do this by saying, okay, psi n xt here, well, let's just use x, not t. Okay, x is this part, then you have uh, 2 over l, and then we know we can, um, we know we can write down sign as so you guys know this right e to the i x equal to cosine x plus i sine x right you guys know this equation okay you can prove it by using Taylor expansion and then so that sine x actually equal to e to the x i x minus e to the minus ix divided by 2i. Okay, let me just double check. Mm -hmm. Then this sign, okay, sign here, can be disassembled into e to the i something x, and then e to the minus i something x, and then this corresponds to the eigenstate of the momentum operator, okay, and then it actually makes sense because one is positive means that the 
uh, part it goes to the right, the other is um, minus, so it goes to the left. So overall, the particles stay at the center, right? On average, it stays somewhere in the center. So if you do that, then we get the 2i in the front, and then you have e to the i m pi l x. So this is your k, m pi divided by l is your k, minus e to the minus i m pi l times x. Okay, so kn is m pi divided by l. Right, so based on this, okay, you know this is the eigenstate, and then you know that the uh, amplitude square here is the probability, okay, of measuring those state, and then you see, okay, these two are equal probability, right? They're only off by a factor of minus one, so that you would say, okay, the for this state, the momentum is h bar k n. is plus minus h bar kn equals to plus minus m pi h bar l and then the probability is 50%, 50%. Right, if you measure it half of time, it will be towards the left, half of time it will be towards the right, and this is the momentum value you measure, okay? It looks great, right? Everyone agree with this? You know, for two years I, I teach, I taught like this, and then because at that time I was not on camera, so I just, Charlie, you want to say something? Oh no, okay. <laughs> so for two years I, I taught like this, and then because it's not on camera, so I left it the way it is and then, and then correct it in the next class. Uh, but then because we're on camera now, <laughs> I don't want people to say UV quantum education is terrible, so I have to correct it right now. Uh, this is actually wrong. <laughs> it, it looks so good, but it's actually wrong. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. Like if you use intuition, <laughs> you can never guess it's wrong. But then the problem, we'll, we'll actually have to show this next class because it will be much more obvious. Uh, but the problem come up as this infinite potential well. Uh, infinite potential well is actually not, um, it's not physical, okay? What that would do is that this is actually not the eigenstate. <laughs> um, it, it's a little bit weird because this eigenstate, you see when you do this, you, d you don't assume any boundary condition, okay? So uh, this is actually not the eigenstate and then the eigenstate is actually very difficult to solve. Um, and the easy way to kind of you know, see that this is this doesn't this is wrong is by compare this to the um, to the Fourier transform, and then if you try to do this Fourier transform for once, actually you can Google it. Uh, you can Google momentum for infinite square well. This is actually a hot topic because uh, a lot of students ask, okay, what's going on, and uh, you can see that the answer from the Fourier transform is very different from the answer by doing this, and. Uh, one very simple thing I can say here, just to um, make you guys aware of you know, what's wrong here. One thing, at least one thing is wrong is this. Okay, this set of so-called eigenstate, they are not orthogonal to each other. Okay, later next class we'll prove it to you. They're not orthogonal to each other, so they're actually not the eigenstate for this, um, for this, boundary condition limited space. And because they're not orthogonal to each other, actually you can use this. You can use this uh, linear superposition, right? Because if you think about it, if we write down, let's say we imagine we're working on a three-dimensional space for vector, right? We write down x, y, z. And usually this, coordinate, they has to be orthogonal to each other, 
right? If they're not orthogonal to each other, let's say if this is two-dimensional space, and then you have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, okay, you have these three so-called bases, but they're not orthogonal to each other, then what will happen is that for every point, you can have many different ways to define that point, right? Say for this point, okay, it could be alpha one plus alpha two. This could be alpha one plus alpha two. It could also be alpha one plus another alpha three, right? Because two vectors by a linear combination can give you any vectors, right? So if they're not orthogonal to each other, if the bases are not orthogonal to each other, then you have more than one way to express your decomposition. And if that's the case, then this value means nothing, right? Because it's arbitrary now, okay? So um, you know, for you to use this, you have to make sure that these are orthogonal to each other, the eigenstates. And usually that's fine as long as it's the real eigenstate, okay, they're, they're naturally orthogonal to each other. Uh, this, this is a very, very special case where I would say a very subtle case where um, the momentum eigenstate is actually not the same as uh, what people expect in um, all other places, okay? And, um, and, and the reason that I usually don't want to go very deep into this is that the problem arises uh, simply because we assume infinite potential well, which is not physical. So you will not encounter this in a real system. Okay, in any real system, the, the potential well is not, um, it's not infinite, okay, unless you start to work on black hole, okay? So, so if you want to know, okay, if I want to measure momentum, and then what is the possible result, and then what are the probability of those, uh, the simplest way to do this is to do a Fourier transform. And then we're not going to go through that because it's just pure mathematics. Any questions here? How does a Fourier transform turn the Poisson function from a function of x to a function of p? Um, yeah, so we covered this a few weeks ago. Um, try to think of a way to. Um, so the way to think about this is that, you know, this integral is, the integration is the same as sum, right? So it's actually a sum of all this plane wave. Okay, and plane wave have a definite momentum. The momentum is k, right? H bar k. So this wave function Yeah, so um, this is for transform, inverse for transform. Um, not that much different. So maybe I missed a sign of plus minus, not important. Um, so the way to think about it is that this integration is just a sum of all these plane wave. And then each plane wave has a definite momentum, right? It's h bar k. So here, it's kind of like this coefficient is this coefficient. It represents the weight of your uh, plane wave. Okay, so it represents the weight of the plane wave corresponding to this momentum. Okay, so this is how you can understand this intuitively. Okay, and then I think the uh, textbook actually give a more mathematical derivation. Um, might be quite helpful to go in there. Okay, other questions? Collapses into just a single plane wave, 
not in this case, not in this case, because in this case, play, yeah, playing with, um, so, so it, let, me, let me answer it in a different way. In general, yes, other than infinite square, well, yes, you're correct. Uh, the only reason that your answer is not correct is because this non-physical infinite square well. Uh, the reason is that in infinite square well, uh, this is not the <laughs> this is not the uh, uh, eigenfunction. So when you measure something, you measure momentum, it will not collapse into this. So for a typical wave, for an um, actual physical wave, when we measure momentum, it collapses into a plane wave. Yes. Do yes. Plane waves have definite energy, so we can know both momentum and energy at the same time. Uh, with the ambiguity of plus minus sign. So if we measure the momentum itself, are, are we just guessing like energy as a vector now? So uh, let me say this, okay. Um, your, your question is, uh, okay, if I measure momentum, don't I know my energy? And then the answer for general case is no. Because in a general case, other than this infinite square well, your, your Hamiltonian has a potential well that depends on position. Right, so knowing the momentum actually doesn't tell you the entire energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then later we'll see that, um, later we'll talk about the commutation relationship, you will see that the best way to, to calculate that, to, to know that beforehand is to calculate the commutation relationship and then see if it's zero. And if it's zero, then you can know the, uh, both of them at the same time. And then if not, then if this is not zero, then you can prove the uncertainty principle, meaning that you cannot know both of them at the same time. Okay. So for general case, if your potential well is not zero, then in this commutation relationship, your momentum has to come to do a commutation calculation with position, and then in general, that's not zero. Okay, you can kind of prove it. In general, it's not zero. So in general, the answer is no. You cannot know energy and momentum at the same time. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Charlie, you want to say something? Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I was just muting myself again. <laughs> yeah, because the the box always jumped to you like for many times. <laughs> um, one thing I want to mention is that like when I whenever I teach, like I I actually um, discuss this with other faculties, and then they always think like it's a bad idea. Is that uh, in almost all of my classes. I always leave one or two times that um, I teach something that is wrong and I don't point it out. <laughs> and then the point here to make is that, you know, people, well, uh, well, I hope you guys didn't watch the presidential debate the other night because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a nightmare. Uh, but the thing is that why people don't believe in science? Why people believe more in religion? The reason is that the education system, right? It's like we're teaching science like the way we teach religion. We ask you to blindly, me, blindly trust me. Even I, I teach something completely wrong, you probably can't believe me, right? If I never ask that question, you probably would believe that. So, so there's some fundamental problem in our education system that the science doesn't, deserve, doesn't, doesn't get the respect it deserves. Um, and I'm not smart enough to figure out that problem, but I think I, I kind of realized that problem. Um, you know, and um, I hope more faculty would do that so that, <laughs> so that at least the student would think a little bit more. And then, um, and, and, the, and the fact is that if all students blindly trust their faculty, their, their instructor, then the science would not, and technology would not, you know, advance, right? It's always been, you have to challenge uh, your instructor, you have to challenge the existing knowledge, okay? Uh, okay, so that aside, let's um, try to come back here. Is that the um, knowing, you know, if you measure the momentum, what's the probability and what the wave is, uh, this problem itself is very difficult in the infinite square well because it's not physical, okay? But what about, you know, measuring average? 
Okay, measuring average is actually well defined. So um, can anyone first make a guess? Okay, before we do any calculation, if I measure the momentum many, many times, what would be the expected value? Zero, okay, I see someone show. Yeah, zero, right? Because if you have a momentum, let's say pointing left, pointing right, sorry, <laughs> pointing right, then the electron will actually move all the way and move out of the potential well, right? And then it's not infinite potential well, you have to trap it. So that the, the best thing you can do for the, for, the, um, for the particle is moving back and forth, back and forth, and on average is zero, okay? And then so um, you can kind of guess it's zero, but then you can also calculate it by using um, by using the um, the expected value. We kind of show this, right? You take a wave function, your wave function, and then the complex conjugate, and then you apply that um, operator on your wave function. and then you do uh, integration, right? This is, we have shown this uh, before. And then um, what you can see is that, okay. Uh, what you can see is that Psi n, the conjugate part is work for this exponential i term and then conjugate times the wave function itself, this part will cancel each other, okay? So that what's left is this part, okay? So you will have two over L, okay? And then sine n pi x divided by L. And then the momentum operator, is h bar divided by i and then differential of x, right? So let's put the h bar divided by i in front, okay? And then you make this differential and sine differential is cosine, right? So it's cosine n pi x l dx zero to l and then when you do the differential, the coefficient come out. Uh, L. Coefficient come out is the m pi divided by L. Okay. So by definition, okay, you can calculate this. And then um, I'm not going to repeat this process here, but uh, what you can do is you can again use some triangle formula. You get uh, this is sine something times cosine something uh, gives you, I think it's one half. And then it's sine two alpha, okay? So you can, you can look at this in the, um, you can look at this in the uh, notes, and then you will see that this integration goes to zero. And then another thing you can see is that the momentum is a real function, right? Sorry, momentum is a real um, measurable thing. So the expected value can only be a real number. And then this integration is real, and this is imaginary, right? So the only physical answer for this integration is that it has to be zero, right? Otherwise you will get an imaginary number for your momentum, which is not physical. Okay, so there are many ways that you can argue that the momentum will go to zero. You can argue that, or you can you know, do the uh, integration, um, and then they will all show you that the momentum is zero.
Okay, so momentum expected value is zero. And then um, the next thing you, we want to show is that the uncertainty of momentum, right? Because we have uncertainty of position, so we can also show that there's uncertainty of momentum when you measure it. And then by definition, okay, uncertainty or deviation of the momentum for the nth state, nth eigenstate, okay, is the expected value of p, expected value of your momentum minus your momentum expected value, and then square, and then do um, expected value, right? The difference between your measurement and your average value, and then square that, and then do average. And then we know that this is zero for all the states, so that this is actually the same as p squared. And here indicate for the nth uh, eigenstate. Okay, so uh, this become something. Um, you know, it, it, well, um, to this point, it's like um, the interesting part. We have all talk, Well, we have all finished the interesting part, and then what's left is a math. Right? Just calculate it again, right? By using the definition again. So you do this integration, and then you have um, psi n p square, and then psi n dx. Right, you do this integration again. And then here, what you can see you know, from previous experience is that, OK, the, the exponential part will cancel each other. And then this p okay, is your momentum then what it would have is that the momentum operator is I erase it, okay. Right. So when you square it, the momentum operator actually becomes The moment operator h bar and then i become minus one, right? So h bar square and then minus one we put it in the front. And then you have second derivative of x. Right? Second derivative of x x because you square it. And then you have sine and pi x L dx. So now if you do this differential, you know one differential becomes cosine, another differential becomes sine. Right, minus sign, right? So you cancel out this minus sign. You cancel out this minus sign. And then this coefficient come out twice, n pi divided by L square. Okay, and then there's a h bar square. And then you do this integration, sine square m pi x l d x. Okay, then again you use the triangle law to reduce sine square to sine or cosine, and then you do this integration, and then clearly here you can see that this is not zero, right? Because this is a positive number, always a positive number. So when you integrate it, it's actually a value. Okay, we have a value here. So that uh, I'm not going to do this integration here. You can look at the note. Or you can use your Mathematica. And um, what you will end up getting is pi n pi h bar l square. Okay, so this is the uncertainty uncertainty of your um, of your momentum. And if you look at it, okay, this is actually kind of like inverse of this. Kind of like inverse of this. So there's a famous equation, I guess some of you might have might seen it, it's like this. Okay, the uncertainty principle. Um, we'll prove it later. Uh, here I just want to say one thing is that this equal sign here, right, it's larger equal and larger than. This equal sign, 
there are some actually very interesting, um, like it's not, for most of the wave, actually, you can't reach this equal, okay? Usually for, for this to, for this to achieve equal to the minimum, which we sometimes call it, um, um, it's, it has to be a Gaussian state, which we actually say it's, it's almost like a classical state, but we'll not get into this. This is uh, like grad level um, content. But you know, the thing I just want to bring out is that uh, when you see this and that, when you finish your calculation, then you see that, okay, they two multiply each other, that doesn't equal to h bar divided by two. That's perfectly fine. Okay, there's no requirement for it to be equal. Any other, uh, is there questions? Okay, now we can move on to non-eigenstate because eigenstate is kind of boring. It just, it just apply the postulate and then do math. Non-eigenstate is actually the fun part. Okay, so uh, we say that, okay, these are the eigenstate and we also say that for, um, let me change a different marker. We also know that there's a linear superposition postulates in quantum mechanics, okay? These are the solution to your Schrodinger equation, but then the linear combination of them are also a solution to your Schrodinger equation, right? So for a state, you can actually be a linear combination of all these states. Okay, linear combination of them. Then um, the first question that will show up here is the normalization, right? It's normalization because the, the absolute Amplitude of Poisson actually means something, it means probability. And then the probability of finding the electron in the entire space has to be one. Okay, no smaller, no larger, but has to be one. So, so for any of this linear combination, okay, your alpha actually is constrained. There is a constraint there is that Okay. This is the probability density of finding electron at position x and time t. And then the integral meaning that the probability of finding the electron in the entire space it has to equal to one, right? It has to equal to one. And because you know, already know what psi n is, so this integration imposes impose equation on the alpha n's. Right, so you cannot arbitrarily choose your alpha n. There's actually a rest restriction or coin normalization of all the alpha n. So um, let's try to you know calculate this and then see what it requires your alpha n to be. Okay, and um, the first thing you can do is just to expand this. Right. And then you know this is amplitude is just this times this. Okay, the complex conjugate times itself. And then and then because we want to know okay what it would do for alpha n, right? So then you can plug in this equation into here. Okay, replace them, then you will get okay, the first one, let's say n alpha n 
because alpha n can be a complex number, right? So you also need to do a complex conjugate and then psi n complex conjugate. And then the second, second one is this, right? It's, and then this is m equal to one to infinity alpha m psi m dx, right? We didn't do much, we just plug in this into this equation. And then we know that you can change the order of integration and sum because they're just all sums, right? They're just many terms summing up together. It's fine to re rearrange them. So you move the sum outside. Okay, and then you have alpha n alpha m and then integration right okay now this integration if you pay attention here alpha n and alpha m they are eigenstates right they are eigenstates so this integration is actually a it will be zero if n is not equal to m, and there are 1 if n equals to m, right? So this is integration is actually delta n m okay, is 0, n doesn't equal to m, 1 n equal to m, okay? If you don't believe it, you can plug in those sign and then give it a try, okay? Um, then what that can do is that it can reduce one of this sum, right? Because right now you can, well, it says some m equal one to infinity, but we know that only when m equal to n, there's a non-zero contribution, right? So that it reduces to n equal to one infinity, and then alpha n conjugate, alpha m has to equal to alpha n, right? Because that's the only contribution here that's not zero. And then when n equal to m, okay, this integration is one because that's normalization condition for your eigenstate. So you end up with this, okay? And then we can write it down again here. Okay. So normalization condition is this, okay? Uh, does it make sense? What does it mean? If you kind of try to interpret this alpha n is the energy eigenstate, right? Because you're solving the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is the uh, eigenfunction, eigen equation for Hamiltonian for the energy, right? So this superposition simply means that, okay, you're summing up all, you're, you're doing a linear superposition of the eigenstate of the energy. Right, so if I want to measure energy of this state, this alpha n here, the alpha n square, empty square, will give me the probability of measuring energy E n. Right, measuring energy E n. Okay, so this alpha n actually means the probability of measuring energy. The probability of measuring energy E n. So because it's a probability, then of course, the sum of the probability has to equal to one, right, because when you do a measurement, there's energy return in your, um, in your measurement, okay? So this one, this, um, this conclusion applies to all uh, quantum mechanical system. It does, uh, it's not only for the uh, infinite potential well. Actually, in this entire calculation, we didn't even use infinite potential well, okay? The only thing we use is that the uh, eigenfunctions, they are orthonormal to each other. Okay, that's the only thing we use. Any questions here? Okay, now we get into the fun part. Um, now we try to answer, if you want to measure position, let's say expected position, expected momentum, and then 
uh, we're not going to show it here, but also expected variance, expected uncertainty. of a non-eigenstate, what will happen, okay? And there's actually some um, very interesting result that shows you the unique feature of quantum mechanics. And we're not going to use this, you know, arbitrary state because that's just mathematically a mess. Um, so we go with the simplest possible state, okay? We go with, uh, we go with the superposition of the ground state and then the first excited state. Okay, and then the coefficient here is equal to each other. So they're equally distributed. That's the simplest one you can ever have. Um, I take that back. The uh, second excited state would be actually the easier. So, ground state and then first excited state, okay? And then um, this one is the second simplest. But then the reason we're not using the simplest one is because that one is boring. It doesn't give you any meaningful result. So let's first look at the question here. Let's call this state one, two, okay? Just give you a label, one, two. Let's say if we want to measure the position, want to know the expected value of the position, you measure position many, many times, what would be like, right? We know that for the we know that for the ground state, the position is at the center. The expected position is at the center. And then for the First excited state, n equal to 2, the position is also at the center. Actually, for all the state, the position is the center. So now the question is that if we do a simple linear superposition of them, would the expected position also be at the center? Anyone make a guess? How many of you think it will be still be at the center? You can raise your hand, you zoom. Oh, you guys have been tricked too many times, right? So <laughs> okay, one of you. <laughs> How many of you think it's not at the center? Okay, one of you. What about the others? You guys are thinking there's no electron there? Can <laughs> you repeat the question? So if you think about it, right, the ground state, if you measure the position, the expected value right, of the position is at the center. The first excited state, the expected position is also at the center. Now, if our state is a linear superposition of them, and then they are equally weighted, right? Now if we, I measure the expected position of this state, would they also be at the center? It kind of feels like it's asking you like, okay, you have 50% probably in the left, 50% probably on the right, so you measure it land at the center. Now I have two of them, that's 50-50. Would the net result be 50-50? <laughs> So it's the same question again. Oh, you guys will love the midterm because it's full of these type of questions. <laughs> okay, um, let, let's see. Okay, so uh, one of you is right, one of you is wrong, and then uh, 10 of, well, we don't have 10 people here, the, the rest of you is undecided. Um, and, and the way to look at this is that, okay, the simplest way to look at this is that
What about I just plot the wave function at time time equals zero, just to you know, just to have some uh, visualization of the what the wave function looks like, right? Your wave function is at time equals zero. Okay, time equals zero is relatively simple because this term is one, right? For both of them, so you don't have to worry about complex number. You have is that square one over square root of two cancel with this, so you have L sine pi x L plus sine two pi x L. Right. So if you look at it, it's just this waveform plus this waveform. Right, this waveform plus this waveform is this. And then there's a coefficient in the front. Okay. Now if you plus these two together, it's actually funny. It's always this when you plus the odd, odd function with the even function. The net result is that the function is neither odd nor even. Right? If I look at the right side, left left hand side, both of them are larger than zero, right? So then you will have, so they enhance each other, so they become larger. And then on the left-hand side, the ground state is plus, is positive, but then your first excited state is actually negative. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of compare which one is larger and then the net result will be like this, okay? So, so left hand side, they two re enhance each other. You can think of it as their, let's say plus plus. They are actually constructively interference with each other. On the right, they are destructive interference with each other. So that the left hand side got enhanced, the right hand side got weakened, right? So that at the initial position, time equal to zero, your expected value should be smaller than L over two, should be on the left-hand side. Okay, should be on the left-hand side. And do you think it will stay on the left-hand side? I start to think eight hours is actually probably a good good pick for the midterm. Okay, you guys will have to think for a long time. Um, yeah. So for the um, let's take a look at what will happen if we change the time, right? If we let it propagate, and then if we let it propagate because we're we're just doing analysis, right? We want to make things relatively simple. Um, the best way to kind of make this simple is that what if we propagate half a cycle, right? Half a cycle here so that the uh, omega knob t equals to pi, okay? And then, and then in this case, n square, right? n here is two, so two square omega knob t become four pi, right? So, If you look at this, if you don't have time here. Let me write it down.
right? So this two state, right? The ground state and the excited state because their energy is different, so that their time, you can think of it as the the time evolution term is also different. So one of them, the phase change actually faster than the other. Right, so you can kind of think of that, okay, the interference pattern, they should change over time. It's not a constant one. So um, we can pick this kind of the easy, easy situation. If the ground state evolve over pi in the phase, okay, time here. And then when it does that, the first excited state will evolve for pi. Okay, and then we know that if you change the phase by pi here, say t prime, then it would be sine pi x l e to the i pi minus i pi. So this one is minus one, right? And then the other one is sine two pi x l e to the minus four i pi. And this one is one, right? Because four pi is just zero. Right? This is 180 degree, this is 720 degree, right? Now you start to see, okay, then, then what you're doing here, this wave function is that for this one, it's a minus sign so that your, your wave function look like this. Okay, this is your ground state at this time. And then this one stays the same because your phase evolution is one, right? So it stays again here, plus minus, okay? So when you add these two together, now it's, the situation is reversed. The left-hand side is plus minus, right? So they're destructive interference. Okay, so it become the value is actually very small. The right hand side, sorry, this is uh, okay. The right hand side, the constructive interference with each other, they are both minus. They're both negative, right? So it's actually quite large. It's plus minus, and because the probability is your wave function square, right? Square uh, amplitude square, so that the plus minus actually doesn't really matter. What it what it really says is that the probability of finding the electron is actually larger on the right than on the left. Right, so that you know that at x t equals to pi divided by omega naught. Okay is larger than okay so that tells us that the particle is moving right at time equal zero the expected value is on the left at time equal to this the expected value is on the right so it's moving from left to right and then you can show it later it's moving from right to left back Right, so it's actually moving back and forth, back and forth. And this is a kind of interesting because in each wave function, the, uh, the particle is not moving, right? For, for individual wave function, if you guys remember the potential, the, uh, sorry, the momentum expected value is zero for all these states. So on average, it's not moving. But then when you add them together, they start, the particles start to move. And this is the effect of quantum interference. Okay, this is the effect of quantum interference. Any questions here? Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is just, I gave you an example of, you know, a superposition state. And then uh, I want to make the example the easiest one. 
So I choose this one. Yeah, there's no specific reason. You will see that again in homework and then in exam. I will choose some function and then ask you to tell me the behavior of the electron. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, by the way, in, in real quantum system, uh, superposition state is way more qu common than uh, eigenstates. And then actually, in quantum computing, you have to use superposition. If you don't use superposition, think about it, okay? In superposition means that your particle can be in ground state and excited state at the same time. So in principle, if you do calculation, you can calculate the value of 0 and 1 at the same time. And if you don't use that, it's just a classical computer, <laughs> right? Every time you use zero, you, you just calculate zero. That's a classical computer. So superposition state is a must have for you to show a quantum effect. Or, or I would say quantum, um, what well, people call it quantum supremacy, but quantum advantage, okay? If you want to see, show a quantum advantage, you have to use superposition. Uh, other questions? Okay, um, let me see, we have 10 more minutes. Wait, so does that mean, Go ahead. Is, if, I, if the electron's like moving left and right, mm -hmm. That's the uh, time average, yes. So the expected value is not time average. Expected value is that uh, hypothetically, you can measure this state, this quantity at this time for infinite amount of times, then what is the statistic, statistic mean of this measurement? So it's not a time average, There's, there are different types of average. So if you measure it at time zero, then it leans towards the left. If you measure at this time prime, t prime, then it leans towards the right side. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah, so it's... So you need to have a constant time. Yes, yes, because whenever you do a measurement, you measure it at a certain time, right? So, so you kind of have to, when you calculate expected value or when you say, okay, I measure something, you have to specify, okay, what time are you doing this measurement? Because this, most of the system are moving, they're not like sitting there still for you to measure, okay? Um, we have, well, we have seven minutes. Okay, let's let's just do it right now. Okay. It's a seven minutes tedious calculation to end this end the class for today, which is uh, not bad. Okay. So um, and now we know it's moving, right? So we know um, you know you can calculate the expected value at the time t for this state one two state, the superposition of one two state. And then you can kind of also think, okay, because it's moving, right? So maybe, just maybe, the momentum is also not zero. It's because it's moving and there's a speed. Okay, so next class we'll calculate momentum one two. Okay, and to do this for superposition state, you really, there's really no other method. You just have to use the definition, right? Because it's just straight out math. Then what you do is that um, you write down x t one two. You know to do this, then what you have is you integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. But in this case, it's also the same as from zero to l. And then you have the um, conjugate of this state. And then your 
the thing you want to measure, the operator, and then your state, one, two. Okay, so you can kind of think, okay, this is a function of position and time, function of position and time. You only do an integral of position, right? So this expected value is on expectation of the position, not in time, right? So you can kind of see that this, if the time term doesn't cancel, then this will be a function of time, okay? And then you plug in, you plug in this to here, which is a little bit lengthy, but then uh, let's try to do it. Um, L, okay, one over L is here. And then the first term is the state and then your conjugate, right? So you have say integral, okay, sine pi x L e to the i omega naught t plus sine two pi x L e to the i 4i omega naught t, okay? So this is the first term, and then you times x, that's the second term, and then you times this one, the wave function itself, is again sine pi x L e to the minus i omega naught t plus uh, sine two pi x L e to the minus i four omega naught t and then dx, okay? Very, very tedious. And then you see that when you multiply them together, you will get four different terms, right? This with this, this with that, this with this, this with that, right? And then uh, the trick here is, you know, just, you know, believe in yourself in the calculation and then the result should be a real value, right? Because you have imaginary terms here. If you do things wrong, it's very easy to end up with uh, uh, imaginary value or complex value. So then you do this, this times this give you, okay, give you um, okay, this times this give you x sine square pi x L, okay. And these two cancel each other. If you check, this is same integral as you calculate the expected value of the eigenstate n. Okay, you can borrow the uh, result there, and then you have this times this is also x sine. Square sine square two pi x l. Okay, and this two, and then this term times this, this times this, you will get x sine pi x L sine two pi x L. And then this times this is e to the minus i three omega naught t plus e to the i, this times this, three omega naught t. Okay, and then dx. Okay, and you kind of see that, okay, this is just cosine, right? Exponential plus add with exponential minus. So this gives you cosine, okay? So this one is just two cosine three omega t. And then this term, okay, if you kind of think of it, you know, this used to give you expected value, and then now you're weighted by half, right? These two are superposition equally weighted by half, so this integration should give you the expect, expected value by half. This one is also expected value by half, so that Okay, what you end up with is this is should be x1 by half, x2 and then integration of x sine pi x
Okay, just do this integration, and then what you'll find eventually, again, you can do it with integration by part. Eventually, you will get L divided by 2. Okay, so it's the time average is at the center. Okay, not surprising, but then it's oscillating. Okay, and at time zero, this term is minus, so it's on the left, and then you can plug in uh, when you go like over pi, then this one would be plus, and it would go to the right. So it's left and right, left and right. It's actually a harmonic oscillator. Okay, it's actually a harmonic oscillator. Um, so that is it for today, and then next class we'll talk about how to calculate momentum, and then you will see that there's actually a general relation between momentum and then position, just like in classical case, but then there's some uh, limitation on that. Okay. Thank you guys. I will stay for a few more minutes to answer questions.